Life on this planet wouldn't exist without three basic elements, air, water, and land. None of us would be here without them. And that's an amazing thing to consider because despite 50 years of space exploration, there's still only one planet where humans exist, this one. The air we breathe, the water we drink, and the land we grow our food on, they're our life support system. And many years ago, I became a lawyer because I wanted to help defend this system, this ecosystem. And in that time, I've seen the rise of a global movement that could revolutionize how we consider this life support system and how we protect this system. This movement is gaining steam globally, with over 100 countries having gotten on board. However, Canada is not among them. This movement is about the recognition of our human right to a healthy environment. Our right to breathe clean air, to drink healthy, safe water, and to live on unpolluted land. And I'd like to tell you a story about why the right to a healthy environment matters. Meet Beatriz Mendoza. She's a healthcare worker, and she lives in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Beatriz lives right near the Matanza Riachuelo River. And this river is surrounded by petrochemical and chemical factories. For many years, this river was one of the most polluted in Latin America. As you might imagine, there are some toxic substances produced by these factories. And after years of exposure, Beatrice got sick. She started losing feelings in her hands and her feet. So she did what any normal thinking human would do, and she visited her doctor. Her doctor told her that she had abnormally high levels of toluene in her blood. And toluene is a chemical byproduct of the oil refining process. Now, when she got this news, she was upset, of course, but she took action. She decided that she would initiate a lawsuit. She hired a lawyer, and she got in touch with her neighbors, many of whom were suffering from similar symptoms. Skin rashes, difficulties breathing, impaired central nervous systems, even cancer. Together, they sued the federal, provincial, municipal governments in Argentina along with 44 companies who were responsible for this pollution. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Argentina, and the local media had a field day with it. They called it Beatriz Mendoza contra el mundo. Beatriz Mendoza versus the world. Her lawyers made arguments on the basis of the Argentinian Constitution, which protects the right to a healthy environment. They said that the pollution in the river did just that. It violated their right to a healthy environment. Now, Beatriz Mendoza, she was focused on her right to a healthy environment too. But more than anything, she just wanted her community cleaned up. She wanted the pollution in the river gotten rid of. In 2008, the Supreme Court of Argentina rendered an important decision. It ordered all levels of government to cooperate together to improve drinking water, to order inspections of all polluting facilities, and to close the illegal dumps, all of which were the cause of pollution. It set strict deadlines so that these orders would be promptly obeyed by governments. And if they weren't, the politicians would be fined. The government, for its part, was spurred to action. The federal government set up a whole new agency. And the number of inspectors involved jumped from three to 246. One million people in this area now have access to safe drinking water. 5,000 people have been relocated from toxic riverside slums and while the entire problem hasn't been solved, and there's still ways to go, there have been some major gains, some major improvements. 
This is the power of the right to a healthy environment. And Argentina isn't alone. The right to a healthy environment, the human right to a healthy environment, is the most broadly recognized human right in the last generation. From Norway to Nicaragua, more than 100 countries now legally recognize their citizens' right to a healthy environment. It has gained, this right has gained the global, global recognition the fastest of any human right in that same period of time, faster than the right to food, the right to health, or the right to water. The purpose of the right to a healthy environment is simple, to safeguard the basic necessities of human existence. Having this right means that no one, not a corporation, no government, and no person can deprive you of the basic elements. Safe drinking water, clean air, and unpolluted land. But in order for this right to be effective, it must be enforceable. It needs legal status. And that legal status must be recognized by governments. The right to a healthy environment is your basic human right. It's my basic human right. But in order for this right to protect us, it must be recognized by governments in law. That includes governments here in Canada. And I'd like to show you a map. The countries in green are those whose countries do recognize the right to a healthy environment. Most of Europe, Latin America, Africa. Then there are the countries in black that don't. You'll note that Canada is among them, the United States, Australia. These three countries consider themselves world leaders when it comes to human rights protection. But the simple fact is, when it comes to environmental rights, they're laggards. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms protects a number of our most sacred values in Canada. The right to vote, freedom of religion, freedom of expression, and it protects us against discrimination. It represents some of our core values as Canadians, but it's silent on the issue of the environment. Now, some among you may wonder, does it really matter? Do we care if our governments or our constitution don't recognize the right to a healthy environment? Well, I say yes, and for two reasons. First of all, most Canadians already believe that their right to a healthy environment is constitutionally protected. Public opinion uh, polling suggests that a majority of Canadians believe their right to a healthy environment already exists. Of course, it doesn't. And secondly, Canada isn't immune from environmental challenges. We face some serious issues and people are feeling the effects. For example, there are many First Nations communities across this country without taps, without toilets, without the basic sanitation and drinking water services that all of us are accustomed to. So I'd like to tell you a story about some people who truly are affected by environmental degradation here in Canada. Meet Ron Plain and Ada Lockridge. They're from the First Nations community of Amgenong, which is not far from here, a couple hours down the road, just near uh, the city of Sarnia, Ontario. Last year, the World Health Organization said that Sarnia is the most polluted city in Canada. Its air is the most polluted in Canada. How did this happen? Well. Sarnia is home to some 60 uh, petrochemical and chemical facilities. Within 25 kilometers of Amgenang and Sarnia, that's how many facilities there are. These are some of the same facilities that Beatriz Mendoza was fighting in Argentina. 
Over 40% of Canada's total chemical industry is located in this region. And one report, uh, one report suggested that the total, the total toxic substances emitted from this area is equal to those emitted by the provinces of Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Manitoba. It's no wonder that this region has the, bears the nickname Chemical Valley. Some of the substances that are emitted from this area include benzene, sulfur dioxide, and others that cause respiratory and cardiovascular problems. These are substances that Ron and Ada have for many years been enjoying breathing. And their friends and family are breathing the same thing. The result is that they fear They fear the pollution in the air in their community. It causes stress and anxiety for them. They fear that every breath that they take, that's something we do 20 times a day, or sorry, 20 times a minute, 20,000 times a day. They fear that every breath they take does a little bit of harm. And most of all, they're afraid of what this might do to their children. So Ron and Ada have taken action. They've done the obvious thing. They've asked for the province of Ontario to protect their air, to protect their community from pollution. Furthermore, they've asked for a cumulative effects study. They've asked the government to evaluate the existing pollution levels and to determine whether new permits ought to be issued for new operations. Thirdly, they've asked for studies to be done to determine whether vulnerable populations, such as the elderly or children, might be detrimentally impacted by further permits. Unfortunately, they haven't been satisfied. And the provincial government continues to authorize new operations in the region. So they took a page out of Beatrice Mendoza's book. And they brought a lawsuit. They're suing the provincial government, along with Suncor, a multi-billion dollar petrochemical company. And the case is before the courts presently. Ron and Ada aren't in this to shut down industry. What they want is clean air to breathe and safe drinking water for their community. They want their right to a healthy environment upheld. But sadly, they're not the only ones in Canada who have struggles like this. The fact is that there are 1,700 communities in Canada where you can't turn on the tap and expect to drink it. Or take a city like Toronto. Here we are, the biggest in, the, biggest in Canada. Millions of people, and every year, hundreds of people die prematurely because of air pollution. This isn't a matter of quality of life, a little bit of smog. It's a matter of life and death. So what can a right to a healthy environment do for you? What can it do for these people who are concerned about their health? Well, let's, let's start with the basics. The right to a healthy environment generates stronger environmental laws. In three quarters of the countries around the world, where a citizen's legal right to a healthy environment is recognized by their government, stronger laws have been enacted or new ones created. And these laws can run the gamut from water quality protection, air quality, land use planning, decision-making around natural resource exploitation, climate change. 
And while strong laws are important, that's not the only thing that the right to a healthy environment can do. The right to a healthy environment can help ensure that there is better enforcement of these laws. Of course, there are many environmental laws that exist already. But they're only so useful if they're implemented by governments. Enforcement is the key to deterrence and punishment of polluters. That's why we have policemen, police, uh, policemen on the streets to implement the criminal code. And we need more environmental enforcement officers. But beyond enforcement, when governments aren't willing to implement their own laws, when they don't take action, and I can't tell you how often that happens here in Canada, then the right to a healthy environment gives citizens, gives you the power to hold government and to hold corporations accountable. I'd like to end today with a visualization. I'd like you to pretend for a moment that you're in Ron and Ada's shoes. <coughs> Let's pretend that this, this talk is over and you're now, you're now headed home. You get on your bike, you get on the bus, and as you approach your home, you see a smokestack. There's some fire coming out the top, black smoke. That's normal. You roll up your window. You hold your breath. And you get home, throw your keys down, fire up your email. There's an urgent message. And it looks like the, the petrochemical refinery across the street has leaked hazardous materials again. You hear the sirens. The emergency vehicles are just outside. But you don't have any more information. None's forthcoming, at least not yet. So you decide it's probably a better idea to stay inside. Now this sounds like, you know, a, a bad dream. But for Ron and Ada, this is reality. This has happened before. And it's going to happen again. And it makes me wonder, what kind of Canada do I want to live in? What kind of Canada do you want to live in? I want to live in a Canada where the right to clean air, safe drinking water, and unpolluted land is something that is shared by everybody. I want to live in a, la in, in a country where we don't lag behind more than 100 countries that already legally recognize the right to a healthy environment. I want to live in a country where my constitution embodies all of our nation's fundamental values, including the value of environmental protection and natural resource conservation. And I want to live in a country where future generations, including my two children, have every opportunity to do what they love, wherever they want, knowing that their planetary life support system is totally intact. But achieving recognition of the right to a healthy environment is the first step towards attaining that vision. And it's a step that we'll all have to take together. Thank you very much.